ready to start. Good morning. Hey, come on, I'm sure you can be louder than this. It's day three and you know, we are filled with so much of content, so much of knowledge in the last two days. We've had so much of success uh, in the last two days. I think you must give yourselves a round of applause because you are the reason why this could happen, right? Give yourselves a huge round of applause. You deserve that. So thank you so much. Uh, good morning once again. Welcome to day three uh, of Cypher 2016 brought to you by the Analytics uh, India magazine. And on behalf of uh, Mr. Bhaskar Gupta, who is the founder of Analytics India magazine, I'd like to you know, thank you all for being here these three days and showing how much you really value uh, you know, being here with us and uh, you know, how dedicated you are to your own profession. So thank you so much. So much. I'd like to take a minute to once again thank our sponsors for supporting us at Cypher 2016, our knowledge partner Deloitte, our platinum sponsors AIG and Jigsaw Academy, our gold sponsor Great Learning, our silver sponsors Brillio, Advancer, Analytics Labs and Cognizant, our exhibit sponsors Contact Singapore, InSophie, Praxis Business School and United uh, Health Group. So uh, before we start off the conference, I'd like to once again remind you of something very, very exciting that's going to happen this evening. And you know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? And that is the awards, yes. So we're bringing to you something very exciting in the evening and that is the awards uh, in association with Great Lakes uh, Institute of Management. We have five categories of awards. And not just awards, but we've also added one or two good activities uh, along with that that can help you winning prizes. So after the awards, we're also going to give away prizes like we do every day for the uh, Cypher Luck, which is a lucky draw. We have all your names in a bowl. We pick out a name and we give you a Kindle. Uh, apart from that, for the best Cypher selfie, so those of you who've been uh, you know, here the last two days, you know that every day we give away a Cypher selfie uh, prize. So we have a photo booth, you go there, you click a selfie, you upload it uh, on Facebook or Twitter with the hashtag Cypher2016 and the best selfie wins a great prize. Uh, apart from that, um, the last two days you've been engaging on uh, you know, our app, a dedicated app Cypher2016. So to make it uh, interesting, we kept it pending for today and today we're going to give away three prizes for three people who have engaged maximum on the app. So those of you who've been engaging, you got to wait for this evening to know who are those three people who are getting great prizes for being most engaging. So, you know, if you've not done that last two days, time to wake up now, do that today because, you know, you may win some great prizes. We have an iPad mini and we have lots of nice uh, things like a Bose speaker, etc., etc. So we hope you're all excited to win prizes like I am. I love winning prizes. How many of you like winning prizes? Everybody does. Great. So, you know, engage. And that's how you can, uh, you know, uh, increase your chances to win prizes. We've had tremendous uh, response at the Data Science Challenge. So congratulations to those of you who made it there. Um, and with our first session today, the evolution of the workforce in a machine augmented and data driven world it's a pleasure to have with us Mr. Mohan Das Pai, who is the chairman, Manipal Global Education Services and RN Capital. He's co-founder of RN Capital and chief advisor to the Manipal Education and Medical Group. He was a part of the Infosys board for over a decade. With bachelor's degrees in commerce and law, he has built a stellar career in finance, administration, education and research, Finical SM and HR. He also works regularly with central and state governments in the fields of education, IT, and business. Give him a warm round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, as we invite Mr. Mohandas Pai on the dais. Hello. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, folks, first of all, I'm very happy to be here because this is one area which I love for a long period of time. I've been CFO of Infosys from 1994 till 2006. And I used to enjoy looking at data, analyzing data, finding out trends, and foxing people. We used to give guidance to the stock markets, and for 36 quarters, we made sure that we met our guidance. And we could do all that because we had almost perfected the art 
of getting data together, analyzing the data, and making it work. And we were in front of a market where there were thousands of people, very brilliant people, who were all putting, pitting their minds to find out what we are up to and trying to analyze data on their own to beat us and to fox us. And the stakes were very, very large. The stakes are huge amounts of money in the marketplace and people who could bet against us and make sure that they had a point of view which was somewhat different could make a lot of money. And in the stock markets, you can short, you can buy long, take positions, leverage, and the rewards are outsized, but so is the downside. And I am happy that we could pit our minds among the best. I used to meet more than 300 investors a year globally, right from 94 till 2006. I must have met more than 5,000 of them, and including investors all, this, all, all the time. And there is only one analyst, Michael Berkowitz of Maverick in New York, who foxed me for a minute because he asked me a question which I couldn't, I had to think to answer. It's not that I couldn't answer, I had to think to answer. It's a very unique question which was based upon a lot of data analysis that he had done. And I could answer him and, well, pull it off. And I complimented him, I still remember him because when you are in this world, you pit yourself against the best the world has. And the only chance of winning is that you know how to look at data, interpret data, analyze data, and do it in your mind at the same time while facing a crowd of 150, 200 people from all over the world who are out there to ask you questions, look at your body language, and then go bet millions of dollars and how your body language is. I'm just saying this to make you understand why data is important in this world. And data has become more important in this world right now because of many reasons. And that's because we are living in the age of disruption. It was exactly maybe 200 years ago when another, a great disruption took place which changed the course of human history. And that disruption was the invention of the steam engine. Because till then, all countries and their wealth depended upon muscle power, human muscle power and animal muscle power. The richest country were the largest countries in the world. So China and India were the large populations, were the richest country in the world, and in 1770, 1780, both made up 45% of world GDP. Then after that, with the invention of steam engine in the UK, in Great Britain, they started the machine age. And the machine age replaced human muscle power, animal power, and created a modern civilization that you know today. And the machine age led to the change in the form of how governments were run, countries were run. Those were the days <coughs> of great empires. <coughs> Kings and emperors ruled. They fought wars among themselves. And there was a feudal structure. Now, with factories coming up, wealth being created, with trade taking place all around the world, merchants arose, the professional class arose, supply chain arose, and the world was very, very different in a short period of 200 years. When human civilization has been there for 8,000 8, years, 200 years changed the way we are. If you go back into history books and see what was there and see what is there today, it's an unbelievable transformation. And all this led to democracy. It led to the decline of Asia, India and China, the rise of Europe, the rise of the United States. Now again, the cycle is coming back. China is rising, India is rising, Asia is rising, and the wheel is going full circle. But the machine age now is seeing another age of disruption, which in the next 15, 20 years will bring about greater change. And that change is something that we need to understand, to understand the context of why data analytics is important, why data is important, and how we should reconfigure ourselves to better prepare for this world. We're all hearing about automation. We're hearing about how jobs are going to disappear because of automation because of artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all nice stuff. Now, along with all this automation, there are a variety of changes that are taking place in a variety of areas which are going to change all this. The first big change that is happening, the first big disruption, is in the field of energy. The world consumes 92 million barrels of oil every single day. And out of 92 million barrels of oil, approximately 32, 33 million barrels come from OPEC, from the Middle East. And they're the largest exporters in the world. 
Out of this, 60% is used to use for consumption in, in automobiles. Now, when the steam engine was invented, the next big disruption was the internal combustion engine. With the internal combustion engine, you could do away with horses and carriage and, and bullock carts. Of course, there are still some bullock carts and, you know, in parts of India. You know, we are a bit slow because we miss various revolutions. And by the time we wake up, we are at the cutting edge because we miss everything else. And this cutting edge is going to help us this time. Now, the internal combustion engine was revolutionary because it shrunk distances. There was the steam engine, the steam board, and the internal combustion engine, and that led to the rise of the aeroplanes, so you could travel around the world in 24 hours. There's a famous novel, Around the World, Journey Around the World in 80 Days. I hope you remember that. Now, what are the big thing about the internal combustion engine? It was a lot, it, 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 it fed an oil, petrol and, uh, you know, diesel, etc. right? So the world depends on oil for its major energy needs, and particularly for automobiles. Now, oil was expensive, and the cartel in OPEC could shut off the supply and raise the prices, and the world has a couple of oil shocks, which led to change in economic conditions right from 1971. Now, in America, they discovered a new technology called fracking, by which they drill, drill vertically and then horizontally and tap into small pools of oil and gas trapped in rock and release it. And this technology, allowed America to become self-sufficient. In 1971, the United States shut down oil exports. Till then, it's the largest oil export in the world. You may not believe it. I mean, it's too, you're all too young to understand all this. But they were the largest exporter. They shut down after 1971. And now, just recently, they have come back and said, we're going to export again. They amended the law. And their production went up from 300 to 400,000 barrels a day to about, uh, I mean, million, million barrels a day. Uh, to about seven to eight, nine million barrels a day. And this increase of, you know, five million barrels a day is what is shifting the world economic condition. All right? So disruption is taking place because of fracking technology, and disruption is now taking place because of autonomous cars. What is an autonomous car? An autonomous car is a car which runs on uh, batteries, on electrical power. A IC has got 2,000 moving parts. An electrical engine has got 18 or 19 moving parts, all right? And now we're seeing the disruption energy where you can have a solar panel, convert solar energy into uh, solar light, solar energy into real ener electric power. Efficiency is maybe 18%, now they say 24%. Put it into storage and plug a car in and drive the car 300 miles. Just about two days back, there's a press release which said that there is a bus which can go for 350 miles uh, carrying his own batteries, and that's going to be revolutionary because that's going to change public transportation. So you get free energy from the sun, and you have this storage mechanism, which are dumb instruments to use this energy. Now, what happens to this 92 million barrels of oil consumed every single day? The world makes about uh, 80 million cars every year. 21 in China, 17 in the United States, 17 in Europe, Japan makes five, you know, India makes two and a half, and the rest of the world comes somewhere in between. Now, they say by 2030, most of these cars, at least 80%, will be electric cars. And if it's auto industry, which has grown up in the last 100 years, where one in six people are employed around the world in the auto industry, it's disrupted by electric cars, which cost $1,500 to run and maintain a year for normal use, as against $11,000 per year for a car run on oil, then you can imagine the change that's going to take place. And this change is also driven by autonomous cars. I was in Delhi two days ago when Uber announced they're going to train one million car drivers in the next two years. Good jobs for the government, right? It's a big, big do. And many people ask, what are these drivers going to do when the autonomous car come? So in people's mind, is already there. And what is an autonomous car? An autonomous car is software encased in the body of a car which is based upon data. It's all about data. So when it travels, there is radar, you put the signals, take the signals, and you analyze the signals and see what is happening, and then, you know, input that into the computer to make sure that the speed and the, and the change in direction, everything is configured automatically using data, right? And it is perfected data to a great extent to automate. And it's built an AI to make sure that all the data coming in creates a self-learning mechanism within the software. 
and you can upgrade the car by downloading software and if you are here in this place you can know when i leaving this place in 10 minutes you can you know just put a message on your cell phone and the car will be outside waiting for you now look at the disruption that's going to bring in the area of automobiles which is the large one of the largest industries in the world in the area of oil oil was a 6 trillion dollar industry because the price coming down is now a 3 trillion dollar industry 3 trillion dollars has shifted from producers to consumers and you know what is happening in venezuela and that's the big change that is coming and all that is driven by automation and by data the other disruption that's happening is in manufacturing how do you manufacture you manufacture by reductive manufacture by process called reductive uh, manufacturing that is you take a piece of you know ore and make it into iron or whatever it is then you chip it away and make a component now we got 3d printing where you can design on the pc and then get a machine to print it out 30 microns or 50 microns using metal powder or plastic and they made a aero engine they made a engine for rockets for nasa they made a racing car they made skull pieces bone pieces everything else they even made blood vessels chocolates food everything else can be done by this machine so what does it mean it means that you design and you do bespoke manufacturing so you don't require this huge supply chains you don't require <coughs> all those vendors you don't require all those component manufacturers because how do how are cars made today you design a car make those components and form it out and everybody makes it together it comes to a place is assembled assembly line with robotics and then it's shipped away then you service it right now you can print a car next to your house download everything else at the machine you go there and it prints a car in maybe 10 hours and you can design the car the way you want no longer depend on anything you want you want a car in a kinky way you can do that you can design it it can be hundreds of design and how are the designs going to work it's on the base of data why data because when you design how are you going to test the car when you design you test the car for testing the car you need data and you put it into non destructive testing on the pc and test the car for performance and get it certified by somebody in the cloud and then you manufacture and take it and go so manufacturing is going to get disrupted in a very very significant way and that is very 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 big the next disruption is going to happen in the area of life sciences today a child born in america is expected to live up to 100 years i don't know whether it's good or bad because you know You don't want some people to live for hundred years. Imagine if Lalu lives for hundred years, it's going to be a problem, right? So, and is uh, and all this happening because improvement in life sciences can help you analyze how your body works. Now, your body is a very complex mechanism. The most complex mechanism created by nature is a human being. You have a brain which has millions, billions of neurons. which you know emit el- small weak electrical impulses and which cause chemical reactions in your mind which retains memory and creates emotion now we all know this long love stories you see in the see the movies you go around trees and sing songs and you got you know you know dreams in your head and you know whatever in your twinkle in your eyes stars in your eyes such a lovely experience right but these are all chemical reactions hatred is a chemical reaction anger is a chemical reaction and they're all reactions because when these reactions happen and some chemicals are released the body responds in a particular manner for example if you are in a forest and you're seeing a tiger come you jolly well going to run and how do you run is automated it happens automatically right and all the muscles have to work and they got to be perfected and you got to run you got to see and you got to run now imagine sevak batting against Uh, Shoye Bakhtar. Shoye Bakhtar is bowling at 160 kilometers. That guy comes and runs, and from the 22 yards, when you have to sit down and face him, there is no time to think. So how does the mind work? How does he hit the six? Remember the famous stroke when Shoye Bakhtar bowled and bounced the ball, and he put his bat there, and he went for a six to uh, you know uh, to third man. Remember the famous stroke? I'm sure all of you have seen that. How did it work? Because the reaction time is so less. The eye sees. the brain computes right the brain sends signals to the body and the body moves the muscles react and the whiff it happens we all see slow motion we don't understand but see it in real life when you go to a cricket match today you sit in the pavilion and see in real life we just don't get it because you turn the eye the guy is bold are there the six so you look at the tv so every time you see a match you look at